No. No, 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 no. He no, wants no, people no, no. to fill into the back first, and if for the elderly and people who need it in the front, we will hand out chairs. But other than that, he doesn't want like people to come in. Oh, chair, I'm gonna sit there. You dig? Do you need a water bottle? Fill in. What we're trying to do is we want tall people in the back, so the small people. And you can sit on the tables and on the uh, benches. Yeah, be careful that van You scare me. Uh oh. That was like a year ago. people in the back, please. And you can sit on all the tables, on all the lap tables, all the benches. Hey, Mike, you want to sit on one of these? Yeah. Yeah. Guys are comfortable. You can actually sit, sit back up on these two. Sit back here with the camera. Don't feel like standing. Would you like a chair? We do have some chairs for, uh, but we didn't have enough for anybody, everybody. So there are some left. Fine. Come on in. Fill in. Sit on tables and benches and stools and everywhere. Everybody all set? Can you see? of the Go Clean, Go Green, Go Algae experiment group. And we're going to be showing you how easy it is to grow algae and turn them into biodiesel. My name is Alex Doyle, and I'm going to be showing you these two reactors right here. I'm Daniel Downs. I'm going to show you the mass production phase and the algae collection process. I'm Steph Sievers. I'll be walking you through the drying process and the extraction of liquid oils from the algae. I'm no coach. I will show you step by step on how to turn the algae oil into biodiesel. We're going to show you from start to finish on how the algae becomes diesel. And to start us off, Alex will take the stage. This is our first reactor. And some cool things about this is we have a bunch of different vessels. And what we can do with these is we can actually take the same strain of algae. Right now there's two different strains of algae, but that's just for show purposes. Uh, we can take all these tubes and put different nutrient combinations into each one of them. We can use one as a control group to actually base the growth from the different tubes off of that one, or use other measures like something called a density stick, and you can measure the density of the algae in the water. Another interesting feature that we have here is we can actually adjust the air levels to each individual vessel. We can turn it off completely, or we can turn it at about like half well, depending on what we want to do. Another interesting feature about that air is we have something called a check valve on each one of these. And, um, a couple people will actually pass them around so you can see them close. But what these check valves do is they actually stop, they're one-way valves, and they stop backflow into the actual tubing. And that allows us, as long as this check valve is on here, we can actually pick up the entire vessel with stuff in it and carry it around the room for ease of access. The nutrients we have on here are just a prototype for now. But some of the big three we have are nitrogen. Nitrogen is essential for a lot of plants to grow, and that can help jumpstart our algae growth. Phosphorus was actually used in a lot of laundry detergents, and they stopped using that because as the laundry detergents were flushed and things like that, they would come out of the sewers and actually kill the wildlife there because it would actually spawn an algal bloom, and the algae would actually absorb all the nutrients and kill off all the other things around it. So they stopped using phosphorus in those laundry detergents. Carbon is another one, and carbon is essential to every living organism, and it's in every living organism. And it's also part of photosynthesis, which the algae uses to get its energy and grow, along with water and sunlight. Um, why don't we have someone from the crowd come up and try feeding these? Brianna. Hi, 
I know you from Fulbright. You're from Fleetwood. So. Why don't you come on? Up? <laughs> come on up the ladder. I'll give you some plant food. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take this, screw it off, squeeze it, pull the stuff out of there, put it over the vessel. Put it, yeah, put it. Any of them, pick one. Just drop it right in there. Yeah, squeeze it. If you want to feed more, you can. Squeeze it again. Squeeze. Squeeze, okay. There you go. We've been using this plant food for now until we actually go into the more experimental phase and start using these different combinations of nutrients. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your help, Nina. And sticking to the photosynthesis side of the algae, over here we have another reactor. And what we can actually do with this one is we can use these wooden partitions we have here, and we can slide them into slots around the entire thing that we have. We can actually adjust the amount of light that goes to each vessel. We can put things in the partitions in like that to completely cut off the light, or we could actually put one in to have it minimal light. We're going to eventually paint these partitions black so that they absorb light. And why don't we have someone stick one of these in just so you can see what it looks like? Uh, Mr. Jones? There you go. I'll give it a try. Which one's like the black? Just like that. That's all it takes. You can use that. Very <laughs> Okay. Now, every living organism has different stages of growth. And for algae, we want to keep it in one specific phase of growth, and that's called the exponential growth phase. That's two right there. Algae starts off in the lagging phase and speeds up to the exponential growth phase, where the algae grows really, really fast. So if there are two algae, it would then become four, eight, sixteen, it would double each time, so it grows really fast or exponentially. With these two reactors, we can figure out what light concentrations or nutrient concentrations are best to keep the algae in this phase, and then we can bring that information over to the larger scale reactors, where Dan's going to show you what we're doing over here. And then we can harvest you know, stuff like that. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm in charge of the mass production part of this experiment. Um, we built a simple A-frame construction that can hold 16 five-gallon water jugs. We currently have eight reactors that are running. Six of them are populated with algae. One went bad, and I'll get to that one later. And one we have with our mascot, Igla the beta fish. Igla <laughs> is just algae spelled backwards. It's just a cute little name for it. Um, we collected our algae from a pond in Pottstown which you can see back here, that all that green on top is a thick layer of algae that rose to the surface because the oils makes it rise. And over here we had a bucket filled where Alex skimmed a whole bunch of the algae off the top of the pond with a pool skimmer and put it in a bucket so we can populate our reactors and start a drying process. And what you can't see in the picture, there was a dock that went to, towards the middle of the lake and it went so far, it went far enough into the lake where the algae was not growing around the oil, or not around the algae. And we uh, harvested water from that part so we can populate the uh, algae in a setting where it's familiar and it has all the minerals it needs so far to grow. Uh, some advantages of growing or of collecting algae from a pond is it's free. Uh, it's very cheap, or it's yeah, it's free. And uh, everything you see here, we uh, we did off of private donations and grants that we, we applied for and we earned. And everything here, we built ourselves. Uh, there was no taxpayer dollars involved. It was all us during school, after school, and whenever we were available. Um, some disadvantages, though, of collecting algae from pond is that we're not exactly sure what strand of algae we're using. We, without knowing what strain, we can't tell how much oil we're going to get from each time we press it, and it's kind of hard because the oil variations, it's just we won't know. And then another disadvantage is we get bugs and snails and stuff, 
that if we don't screen the algae good enough, it'll get in the reactor and then it'll die and decompose in the bottom, and it'll it'll just sit there and it'll just smell disgusting. And on, on smells, there are three types of smells. There's a bad smell, which is just algae. It smells kind of like wet grass or seaweed. And then there's a good bad kind of smell where it's just a lot stronger than the first smell. It's that's when you know it's ready to be harvested. If you notice in the front three over here, there's a thin layer of algae on the top, which we will harvest today. And then there's what we call zombie bad. And <laughs> if you notice here, there's like it looks like dirt in the bottom, but that's just the decomposition of of um, animals or not animals, insects and stuff. And I'll get some out for you and show you. As you can see, in the water, the water is black, it's not clear, it's not green, and that's all the, the decaying matter from all the insects and plants and stuff that decayed in the bottom. I'm just going to put it back in the reactor for now because we're, we're, I left it in here for showmanship purposes so we can show you what's in there. Um, now, can I have a volunteer, Mr. Miller? Can you come, <laughs> come, uh, come gather some algae out? I'm happy to volunteer. <laughs> and then get, I want you to get as much algae out of there as you possibly can. Okay. And just skim. Yeah, on. skim. You can go a little bit on here. See how you're getting all that? Yeah. And just put it in the glass when you got it. Now, why don't you touch the algae for me? <laughs> now, describe to me how the algae feels. Grainy and almost like a little gritty sand. Mm -hmm. kind of feels it feels cool. slippery to you. Yeah. Feels like what I used to eat for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> this strain of algae is particularly grainy. Um, the slipperiness to it is the oil on the outside, which is helping it float. And Steph will show you how to extract the oil. So can you please take that over to Stephanie? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Miller. If you'd like to wash your hands, the sink is okay. there available for you. Okay, once again, I'm Steph. I'm going to be showing you how we expedite the drying process and then when we dry the algae. The, expedition, the way we are going to expedite our drying is by a process called scraping. But to help me out, I would like Mrs. Sherman to come out and help me. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a screen. It's like an everyday screen. You have it in your windows, any like that. And then we're going to use a firm backing. It's, we want it to be waterproof. We don't want the water to absorb it. So what I'm going to have you do is hold this with one hand, and then you're going to use your ceramic tile float, and you're going to put this in your other hand, okay? We're going to keep this in an angle to allow the water to run off and the algae to stay on. So I'm going to dump our algae onto this, and you're going to press out as much water as you possibly can. All right. you can firmly, yep. As you notice, the water runs down. I don't know if you can see this, but I'll show you in the container. All right, good. that's good. All right, so now that we have this, I can take the float from you. You're gonna, can you help me move it to our drying rack? Okay, so we're gonna put this over this and then move it back. And I'm gonna slide out our backing and it's gonna go on here to further dry. And then I'm gonna set this off to the side and I'm gonna have you take our excess water, the little bit of water we have, I don't know if you can see it, right here. It has our algae and we're going to take this and put it into our container over here that died. Would you like to do it? <coughs> All right. So we're going to dump it into here. This is going to help to purify our system. If we take it from the pond, like Dan said, we can get organisms that die. By using the already um, algae that we grew, we're going to help to um, help grow more purified algae. So now you're good to go. You can take a seat or stand. Now that we have everything cleaned up slightly, we're going to go two days later because we can't have enough time to show you that. We're going to come over here to our dried algae. 
are dried algae, we want to use dried algae because it's easier to break the cell membranes. A good example of this would for you to be, say, cooked pasta. If I take cooked pasta and I try and bend it, it's going to be pliable. It's just going to bend. It's not really going to be breakable. But if I were to take uncooked pasta, I would be able to snap it. This snapping is what we want to occur with the cell membranes. The cell membrane, when it breaks open, that allows for the lipid oils to drop, to pull out. So then, what we're going to do is we're going to come over here. And for right now, we're using, I'm going to be showing you later, our orange juice press. <coughs> yes, when we bought somebody's orange juice press. And we're going to put our algae in here. But this is just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to actually set up our algae while Alex talks about how our press is going to actually be designed. So we plan to actually build a prototype oil press like this. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking iron pipes to create a very strong frame around the entire system. And then we're going to take another iron piston and we're going to actually put that in there. And we're going to take another metal vessel and we're going to put lots of small holes in that throughout the entire thing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that small vessel and stuff it with as much algae as we can possibly fit in there. Then we're going to put something over the top, the top plate, like that. Then we're going to use the two-ton jack you see over there and place it onto that top plate. And jack it up just high enough so that it makes contact with those pipes. Then to extract the oil, we can actually jack that up again. And the two-ton jack is going to be able to squish out all the lipid oils from that algae and it will pull in a reservoir below. We're not going to get a, an effect I mean, or a yield that what that good with Steph's barn shoes press over there because Steph doesn't really have the same strength as a two-ton jack. <laughs> that's, also, that's also made for oranges and not algae. Thanks, so. Alex. Okay. <laughs> so obviously I'm not going to be able to get as much out of our press here, but for demonstration purposes, I took our cheesecloth and then I put our algae in it and I'm going to twist it so it gets a firm seal. I'm going to place it into our press and then when I gradually put this down, I'm going to make sure I get as much of this in here as possible. I want to keep the algae in it. It would be a mess if I let it go all over the place. So I'm going to push down as hard as I can. Underneath this, there's a reservoir that's going to collect as much of our lipid oils as possible. <laughs> okay, so then, as you can see, we started out with white cheesecloth. You can see our lipid oils in this right now just by looking at our changing color. Unfortunately, bottom. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are collecting the lipid oils in our cheesecloth and not our reservoir. But this will be this won't happen in our actual process because we're not going to be using cheesecloth. The press is going to be it won't have the cheesecloth. It'll go straight to our reservoir. So now that I broke my cell membranes to get as much of the oils out as possible, I want to soak this in hexane. Hexane is a chemical, and I don't want to get this on me, so that's why I have my gloves on right now. I'm going to put my um, crushed algae into a beaker, and then I'm going to take, normally I would soak the algae in hexane for a while to let it, the, what hexane does is it binds with the lipid oils, and it helps to extract it from the algae. So I'm going to just drizzle this over it for right now to show you to get the idea. Hexane does have a slight smell to it. So once I have it soaked, I would let it sit normally for a little while. I'm going to take it and put it back into the press. And then once again, I'm going to press it. This will now, you should be able to hear it, or the people in front the lipid oils and the hexane are going to extract from the algae. When I take out my reservoir, you can see our hexane and the lipid oils. Now we're going to put it into the beaker so you can actually see it. Okay. So there is our hexane and lipid oils. Now when we convert our he hexane, when we convert the lipid oils to our so we don't want the hexane. So what we do is we put it into a still. The still is going to boil the hexane and the lipid oils to about at a 60, 60 degrees Celsius. At 60 degrees Celsius, the hexane will evaporate, but the oils will stay inside the beaker. So when this, the, the hexane evaporates, 
it goes inside the still to the cooling coils, and then it's going to condense. When it condenses, it'll go into another beaker, and we'll be able to reuse this hexane so we're not losing any products. This is just another way we're, re we're recycling everything we use. Now that I have my lipid oils, per se, because I don't have enough right here to actually show you what's going to happen from converting it from lipid oils to biodiesel, Noah is going to show you using your everyday vegetable oil. So, here you go. Thanks, Noah. Um, okay, so as you may have noticed, I've been measuring things out and doing chemistry like things. So, <laughs> I weighed out two and a half grams of sodium hydroxide, which can be found at any hardware store, and it's just a drain opener. I measured 110 milliliters of methanol, which is found in heat, which can be bought at Walmart, and it's a gasoline additive. And then I have vegetable oil, which I'm, I have 250 milliliters of vegetable oil, which I'm heating up to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So. Celsius. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you see why we're standing so far back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I need some help with this. So, Dr. Ulrich. His gloves and goggles. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is add the sodium hydroxide and put it into the methanol. So be careful because when you add it, it, pr it produces a gas that can be toxic, but because we're using such small quantities, it won't hurt anybody. But if you're using larger quantities, you want proper ventilation. So Dr. Ulrich then just shake it up and it might get a little warm because it's an exothermic reaction, which means heat's also a product. So just shake it until all the sodium hydroxide has dissolved and reacted with the methanol. No, it won't split. Take it right away. Yep. Okay. So now shake it real well, and it, there will be high pressure, so up. And relieve the pressure because when there's constant volume and temperature increases, then pressure also increases. Okay. Yeah, you shake it for five minutes, but since we don't have that time, Dan will take it to the back room and continue shaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. You can de glove and de glove. Okay. Okay. So the reaction that occurred, we had our triglyceride, which was our fat. We had the methanol, and we had sodium hydroxide, which was our catalyst. This reaction can occur unless the catalyst is present. There are two products that are formed from this reaction, and that's the biodiesel and the glycerol. The glycerol is just your everyday soap that you use. There are R, there's R1, R2, and R3, and they aren't uh, actual elements. They're unique to certain uh, fats, and they become part of the biodiesel. 
So after we finished shaking, and we let it sit in a cool, dark place for 24 hours, and it will separate like this. The bottom is the glycerol, which is the red stuff, and then the yellow stuff on top is the biodiesel. So what we do next is we pour them off, pour off the biodiesel, Put it in the same container. Same, okay. Yeah. So we'll pour off the biodiesel very carefully so then we can separate the biodiesel and the glycerol. go nice and slow until the only thing left in the original bottle is the red glycerol. And the reason that the biodiesel comes to the top is because it's less dense than the glycerol, which is like how most uh, oil is and fat. So this is the glycerol, and this is the biodiesel. And after this, we wash the biodiesel to make it more clean. So we put uh, warm distilled water in, and then we recap it, and we slowly shake it, slowly rock it back and forth. And that gets any other glycerol, because it binds with the water, to, come to separate from the biodiesel. And that's how you go from algae to biodiesel. Are there any questions for anything that you've seen so far? Yes? If somebody had a pond and really didn't want to utilize or, or have algae in their pond, based on what you've presented here, what would be the best environment for them to prevent that? For the algae to grow? For it to not, yeah, for it to not grow, though. For not to grow. It's not really something you can prevent that easily. You yeah. have to use like chemicals and stuff in your pond, I would imagine. Strictly chemicals. Yeah. yeah. That's also something we didn't really research. We were researching more of like how to grow it instead of how to kill it. But based on what you did, yeah. yeah, based on what you did, what was the least conducive environment for what you've done so far? No nutrients. Like if things, okay. if the pond, I guess. If there's nothing in the pond to filter it and things will just like die at the bottom, I think that would kill most of the algae. Yeah, if it lacked nutrients, that, that would be most of it would kill it. And if it didn't have a lot of light, because it does it is it does use photosynthesis and it needs that sunlight too. Later on in this plan you might want to just donate the algae. <laughs> we'll come clean your pond. <laughs> yeah. There are all, all forms of algae as you had pointed out. Um, do all types of algae, uh, are all types of algae uh, amenable to conversion to uh, biodiesel? Actually, pretty much every plant and almost every living organism has these lipid oils in their cells. Oh, really? Like fish oil, for example, like a pill that you would take, that's another oil, you could convert that to biodiesel. Algae would just, is just the most efficient because algae is the fastest growing plant, like around. So that would be the most lucrative to use for conversion to biodiesel. But essentially, you could use almost anything. Some things might not have as much oil, but they all have it. And one thing you'll learn in the in the Y section, they'll have a graph or they'll have a, a chart that will say like 
per acre per year, corn will have about 18 gallons of uh, oil per acre per year. Um, the next, what they, the next leading one besides algae is palm, and that'll be about 50 to 60 gallons per acre per year. Algae, if you if you harvest it and get the best strain possible, you can get a, a thousand five hundred to about five thousand per acre per year of oil from just algae. Any other questions? Okay, so if anybody would like to come up and take a closer look at our construction and our vessels experiments, you can do so now. And if you're, if you're done with that, uh, they're going to be reconvening in the Annex Cafe. There's going to be some food in there, and then eventually we're going to swap over and be taking this group over to the other team, which is going to present why we're doing all this research. Thank you very much.